All right, thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. I'm John Hyatt. I'm Vice Dean for Faculty. Uh, much, much of this series has been organized uh, by uh, Dr. Gordon very capably, so, uh, so we thank her for that. The program today uh, is called Ensure Your Promotion Through Creativity and Research Navigating it, as part of the Navigating the Academic Roadmap series. And I want to start by just asking, because it's an appropriate question that Dr. Levine asked, can we just see a show of hands? How many are in either basic scientists or in basic science departments? You can be in a clinical department, but basic scientists, and then how many are in clinical departments? Okay, so we have, it's about, about an equal representation on, uh, on both sides. We've assembled uh, an August panel to uh, help to consider some of these matters, and I'm going to try to uh, spend most of the time with the panel speaking and then with the time for all of you to ask uh, questions of the panel. The panel in alphabetical order, I put myself at the bottom, but in alphabetical order includes Dr. Galen Cortinus, Professor of Pathology and Lab Medicine, Dr. Rita Efros, also Professor uh, from that department, Dr. Michael Levine, Professor of Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Sciences, and Dr. Janet Pregler, who's Professor of uh, Clinical Medicine. Most of, uh, really all of these uh, people are uh, senior uh, members of the faculty, uh, and many have had uh, a great deal of experience uh, in the kinds of academic matters that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, I want to just, uh, first of all, start by uh, calling your attention uh, to a website uh, about the UCLA call. We're often told that people either don't know what academic series that they're in uh, or don't understand the requirements for progress uh, in academic series, which and if that's true, I consider that a great failure on all of our parts, and I consider myself um, personally responsible for that uh, and would like to remedy it. But I think that a good place to start in these matters uh, is the call, and uh, we'll see. Perhaps the panel will have comments about this as well. This tells the requirements for all of the, the basic academic series, and I've shown, uh, I've shown you the website uh, here. I suppose you could say the devil could quote the call to his or her advantage, but I think that it's a, it's a good starting point uh, to understand the requirements of, of the different series. Since the topic today is going to be about, it's going to be primarily uh, about what constitutes uh, creativity, creative endeavor, creative output, and how that's, how that's valued, how it's measured, and how it's valued, I wanted to put up for sake of discussion a variation on a table that we've shown before, but just to show uh, the major professorial series and to show then ac across the top, I have a pointer, but oh, I know you have to, the first thing you have to do is turn it on. Right, well, across, across the top of the table, uh, the four major elements that uh, are uh, measured and valued really in all of the series, I think except the adjunct series, research, teaching, uh, uh, clinical activity, and university service, clinical activity relevant uh, to the work of clinicians, obviously. And just to show that uh, in the regular in residence series, I would say that uh, with four stars, research uh, is, the, is the primary element with the other elements as shown. Uh, in the Clinical X series, this is a, a series for master teachers uh, and clinicians. In the Health Sciences Clinical Series, primarily uh, teaching and clinical service. And then the Adjunct Series is the one that's perhaps you could say is asymmetrical in the sense that this is for, this is a series which would primarily emphasize either teaching or research, but not necessarily in the same measure and not necessarily with the, with the other elements. So with that, I'm going to ask if the panel wouldn't mind coming up and sitting up in the front. And I think I'm just going to ask uh, for some comments from, uh, from each of them about uh, you know, their thoughts, uh, e either in their own experience or more generally about what would constitute uh, creative uh, endeavor, uh, creative output. And maybe we'll start with Dr. Levine, who's already pointed out to me that that's a hard question to answer because it depends upon what, what series one is in. We'd appreciate just some brief comments from each of the panel, and then uh, then we're going to open it up to questions. So we'll start with Dr. Levine, since you positioned yourself at the farthest point there, I if that would be okay. Myself here. This is one of the <laughs> on the spotlight. Yeah, I'm going to take off. I'm going to turn off the slides. Um, Sorry. Okay. So, how many here are actually know what series you're in? <laughs> that's not everybody, huh? 
How many of you are in the in residence for regular FTE series? Two. And how many of you are in the health science clinical series? Four or five. And then the rest of you are not employed at UCLA? <laughs> How about no, I presume there are no adjuncts here, right? Yeah. Oh, there are. Okay. Okay. Adjuncts. Mm -hmm. adjuncts. All right. Okay. So, creative academic activity differs by your series. And you really need to know your series first before you know what you need to do for creative academic activity. Um, the easiest series to talk about is the regular series or the in residence series because they are the, you need to do research. You need to have a research program or be a significant part of a research program. That's it. That's what you have to do. If you can't do that, or you haven't done that, you're not going to advance in that series. And what that means is, um, it, it means slightly different things in different places in this university, but mostly it means writing papers that many of them with you as the primary author, not necessarily the sole author, but certainly the person pushing the research, it also means you need to get funding for your research, which is kind of tough today. Um, those are, and it also means that you have to be recognized outside of UCLA for your research contributions. That's just that those in residence and regular series. In the health science clinical series, there is a whole laundry list of things you can be doing for what we call creative academic activity. And in fact, I wrote a lot of the laundry list um, with uh, Richard Gold, who is the now assistant dean. And it starts out at the top of the list is research. But the difference here is you just need to participate in the research. You just need your name on papers or on um, presentations at meetings. You just need to be part of grants. You don't need to initiate. You just need to be part of the research series. After that, you can do all kinds of things, different kinds of teaching, setting up courses, setting new clinical, um, clinical services, reevaluating services. There's about 16 things on that list. If you are in the Clinical X series, the major thing you have to be is a master clinician and teacher, but you also need to be involved in some research. And in the adjunct series, as Dr. Hyatt said, it's kind of a mixed bag of what you can do. You can be both in research and teaching, but those are the things that you need to do. So I'll just stop there. Why don't we, why don't we keep going and see what maybe Dr. Dr. Efros, would you add to that or speak about, uh, about this from your own experience or, well, from, or um, from the perspective of CAP, perhaps? Yeah, you're, that's probably, <laughs> you're probably legally bound that you can't say anything officially. Well, but. I can't say anything officially about anything specific, but one thing I've learned from my year on CAP, CAP is the Council on Academic Personnel and all the major promotions, four-year four year reviews, tenure cases get discussed and reviewed at CAP. And one of the things I've learned is that the self-statement is, is really, really central and so important to everything else because um, your description of your work, you know it better than anybody else does, and you have to be able to explain it in a way that English professors and comp lit professors and geology professors understand. Now, you don't want to make it too simple and too superficial, but you have to give a few, um, you know, framing remarks about what your research is and the significance of it in the field and what your contribution was. So that that's to say that um, you should avoid modesty. <laughs> I mean, people like to be modest sometimes, but in this case, you should really, no one else is going to toot your horn if you don't do it. So you should really try to sell yourself, but of course not oversell, not overstate your case. But writing a really good personal statement is central to the review because a lot of times at the department level, the committee that first reviews your dossier looks at that statement because many people in each department really don't have the precise expertise even within your department to understand the importance of your research. So you have to explain it to your colleagues who are doing the first level of evaluation and then when it goes up to CAF where you have a university-wide 
panel, they have to be able to appreciate it. So first of all, explain your research and put it in its proper perspective. The other thing is that you know most of us write papers that are really highly collaborative. Um, often you may write a review that's a sole author, but most papers are, have joint authorship. It's really important to um, explain your particular contribution to the paper. The other thing is that sometimes you you may have started your career under the mentorship or the collaborative work with a colleague or a mentor, uh, and then you want to establish your independence. So it's really important as you progress in that direction that you establish the independence. So not every paper should have your mentor as a co-author. You have to make an effort to develop uh, an independent line of research that shows that you are independent and creative, of course. So I would say that um, that personal statement should not be just jotted down in a quick thing and get it over with. That should be something you spend a lot of time on. And sometimes you could ask um, more advanced colleagues to look at their personal statements to get an idea of how to frame that. But the main thing is to not try to be too modest. You've got to explain how important your work is and how the creative contribution that you've made even in a collaborative effort. So I'll stop there, but that's what I learned from being on CAP. There are some beautiful personal statements and some really sloppily put together statements. Dr. Cortina. Hi. So I'm in the clinical series and I probably only have expertise uh, in that area, although I've been on a few academic review committees. Um, I do want to reiterate uh, something that uh, Dr. Efro said, which is about your personal statement. And it comes from um, one of our uh, senior faculty, Alistair Cochran, who says, when you write your personal statement, write it in such a way that it sickens you. <laughs> and then back off just a little bit. <laughs> Good. Okay? That's probably the main pearl from today. Right. <laughs> I've carried that with me since I, since, I, since I got here. It's very hard to do. Um, I've also read um, personal statements where the creative portion looks like the online appendix from a science uh, article or a nature article filled with technical details, which will mean almost nothing to most people who read the statement. So you're going to have to translate, translate that into English. And I think the last time I put together my personal statement, I translated it into caveman. Okay. I just said initially what a surgical pathologist does, because I think even within my department, if you, act to a, if you talk to a clinical microbiologist, they don't actually know what a surgical pathologist does, and we don't actually know what they do. Um, so, to those of you who are in the clinical series, from a practical standpoint, I want to say the following. Advancing is not that complicated. It is still easy to get lost, probably because you're energetic, motivated, shiny penny folks and you're responding to all kinds of influences. But keep this in mind. You've got four bins that you have to fill. One is your clinical practice. That you will fill easily. There's always enough patient care work to do that you will fill that bin. Overfilling that bin will not get you anywhere. So that's going to be done. The next is teaching. For the most part, um, your teaching on the clinical side is going to be with residents and fellows and perhaps with rotating medical students or, um, uh, or, or graduate students from uh, programs which are designed to be uh, clinical uh, service anyway. And you know that time counts double. If you spend four hours a day taking care of patients, but you end up saying everything twice at four levels of sophistication, um, you're teaching and practicing at the same time. So that, that counts double. Please make sure you give yourself credit for that in your CD, your data summary, and your personal statement. Now, coming down to research and creative contributions, I look at this in two ways. You can be cynical and find the most obvious way to promote yourself, which um, in my field tends to be case reports that you're not particularly interested in, but it seems easy to write. You've got a motivated, rotating person from another university who says, I want to write this up, and you say, fine, I'll put my name on it. But you won't enjoy yourself. So find a creative outlet that is tangible and that you enjoy. Because if you enjoy it, it won't be work. Um, um, I was speaking to a, a new faculty person uh, recently. I guess details are off the table. And this particular new faculty person was very excited about developing a clinical service. And this new faculty person um, had everything 
but something tangible for this service. This, he, he, he knows who the higher-ups are, he knows the space, he knows the target population, he knows how to promote its growth, but there's no name, there's no director, there's no um, plan for demonstrating the growth in this area. And so all he's got to do now, since he really is very excited about this, is give this a name, put it on the department website, start to keep track, and of course, the, the, his natural curiosity will give him questions to answer. He'll want to know, did this new service produce anything positive? And you can, those questions come to all of us. When you're hired here, you're hired here under extreme promise. Everybody wants you to succeed. You wouldn't be placed in a professorial position if someone didn't recognize energy, talent, um, you know, motivation. And to be honest, hiring is a drag. We want you to succeed. This isn't some sort of hazing or pyramid program. So for that, for that to creative or research component, don't do something cynical. Don't just try to, to uh, find a way to stick around in Southern California, sunny university hospital setting. There's actually a reason why this hospital is here. It's a major city. It's in a great, uh, a great uh, um, geography, climate. It's at a major university. All those things aren't by accident. So now that you're here, do something good. And uh, that'll take care of itself. The last part is service, and I've actually seen service coming in many, many, um, uh, many uh, facets. You can uh, join a committee because you see a problem area. You can be doing something out in the community, or there's infinite ways to contribute uh, to the university. I suppose this uh, diversity angle in our dean's office is, is one. That's all I got to say. Thank you, Dr. Pregler. Um, so I'm Janet Pregler. I'm actually in the Clinical X series, which is really something that you transfer into, um, usually at the associate professor level. So if anyone has a particular interest in that, you know, from the clinical side, I'm happy to talk to you about that later. Um, I uh, serve on the CAP for the Department of Medicine. So again, you know, reviewing dossiers of people from the different um, uh, the different series and you know I'd say everything here I was nodding my head absolutely um, I think the one thing you know that I'd kind of echo is I, I think it's helpful to look at those four bins and really think for yourself um, how could I um, you know we talk about this in fundraising but sort of a, a cocktail party you know in one or two sentences I can describe what I'm doing in each of these areas and particularly as you're starting out to do that um, because I think one of the things that we sometimes see you know as we're struggling with promotion for people is um, you know do they have a direction in each of these areas so again if you're in the regular series your main issue is going to be research and the main questions is, as we've heard are going to be how many papers did you publish? Were you first or last author? And what's your funding? Okay. But for your educational component, you want to be able to say, you know, this is where I educate. This is what I do. You know, so there's sort of a clear um, direction to that. And, and again, just to echo for the people who are in the clinical series, um, it's so helpful if you can identify, as you're saying, that area of your interest um, so that we're not seeing sort of a case report and then you know an educational module over here and there's not really a connection but that we can really see you know here's the niche that you're doing I will say um, still and it frustrates me a bit um, the committees really do need to see in general something in writing about that creative effort um, you know so if you went out and and developed a program that you know did terrific things as an example for patients with AIDS in South Los Angeles and we'd all think that's great um, the committee needs to see something there you know whether that's a case report whether that's a written educational module you know something sort of tangible um, to really um, say what you're doing there so you want to think and strategize about how you're going to do that um, for the creative component if you're on the clinical uh, side so I think we've crossed the gamut here, really, of all of the all of the series, and I'd like to invite some questions. I'll ask some if you don't, but let me say what I say to the medical school class. If you're thinking of the question, other people are thinking of it as well. Please ask all the questions in public that you're going to otherwise come up and ask individually at the end, because I, I promise that everybody wants to hear them. So how about some questions for the panel? Don't be shy. Yes? Hi, I have a question. When you were talking about those four bins Well, what I tried to indicate on the first, we'll get the comments of the panel, what I tried to indicate on the first slide is that 
they are, I think, weighed differentially depending upon the particular academic series. Is that fair to say? So the emphasis is different depending upon the particular academic series. We wanted to actually focus primarily today on what constitutes creative endeavor. So it really is the research, that first, that far left column research that we're talking about primarily, although we can talk about other, other aspects today as well. But in a sense, uh, just to say it again, research primarily uh, in the regular and in-residence series, uh, teaching and clinical excellence in the clinical X and the clinical series, and then in the health sciences clinical, and then for adjunct, usually a combination of teaching and or, and or research. But that's a critical point, is that different things are weighted differently depending upon the, uh, the different series. Are there comments about that? Did I say that adequately? Or? Well, pretty much, except again, I would emphasize the point that Dr. Levine made, which is creative work in the in-residence or regular series means research. Three lines, essentially. If you're in the clinical series, it can be participation in research, often is, but that's not a requirement. So you can also meet that as an example by being a recognized educator who writes review articles and chapters in a certain area. Um, and I think it really depends on what you become involved in, again, on your passion, and also you know, where you're working and sort of what's going on around you. For some clinicians, it's fairly easy to become involved in research projects by recruiting patients or you know, you're working in that kind of unit. For others, it may be more an educational focus. It just kind of depends. For instance, if there's a professional society as part of your, your, your mission um, and you want to do work with them because they often have established projects, you can get involved in that and you can, you can be an entry level local lecturer and then eventually you know, work your way up into, into uh, higher um, um, offices in this professional society and you will have something tangible. You, know, you are now you know, the west of the Mississippi director of you know, brain and pudding, whatever your society is. You know. So the way that it's most easily handled is you have to remember that when you're being reviewed by agencies, especially outside your department, you're just a bunch of pieces of paper. And so what I suggest um, for the junior faculty in my department is that when you write your self-statement and you're, you want to talk about your creative academic activities and it's not research, which is always, the evidence of research is always papers and things of that nature. What you do is you make a list of the things that you consider your creative academic activity and stick it as a bulleted list on the end of your self-statement. And then make sure that you have in an appendix or somewhere else the evidence for it. So if you've the easy one to do is if you've generated a new clinical course, for example, include the syllabus for that course as something you would put in your appendix that you can stick onto your file. If you've generated, you can do this, if you've generated new websites that relate to a clinical service or relate to an educational activity, include the, the link to that website and also include maybe a printout of some of the pages of the website. So all of this gives the evidence of what you've done in creative academic activity when it's not research. When it's research, it's always easy for reviewers to figure out what you've done because there are uh, manuscripts or, or references or things like that. When it's not research, then it's more difficult. So you can do that to have the reviewers you could, you could help the reviewers by, by doing that in your self-statement or at the end of it. So I'm, also, I'm, I'm sorry to, to butt in just for one second. Uh, just to say that in my experience, uh, opinion and experience, educational innovation is quite publishable nowadays. There's a lot of interest in, in uh, ways to innovate uh, in teaching modalities uh, at any level, residency, medical school, fellowship, and beyond. So probably possible to publish things that you've done that are innovative and do a medline search and just find similar kinds of papers that gives you a target journal or meetings. Meetings are another way, especially when people are parts of uh, program director organizations or other organizations where there's interest in educational uh, output. And that's, a, that's an easy way to, I think, to document some of these things. I'm sorry, I interrupted someone. I was just going to oh, say, um, 
it seems it seems possibly more natural when you've developed a new syllabus or something to put that under your education or teaching um, bin. But you can sort of milk it for something else too. If there has been a real need for a new approach to a certain topic, or if you've done something creative to develop this syllabus, or there never was a syllabus in this particular area, use that not only for your educational or teaching bin, but use it for your creative bin. So you can use things in two ways and don't feel that you're overselling your case if you do it that way. More questions? I want to restate the question that you're talking about now, just in reference to something like an educational innovation, a syllabus, yeah, something like, like that. Creative. But it's actually, well, I think it is how do you, it's the broader question of how do you take credit for right. pro, how do you take useful credit as far as promotion goes for, for these, for a creative endeavor? But especially when you are Julie, you know, you, you, you can contribute ideas, but then it has to be, finally, you know, somebody has to okay. Um, so how do you, how do you communicate that? In your self typically, that you have been involved in the generation of a particular entity, and your contribution has been the following, and you just kind of write it out. Um, that's about it. The other way you could have is whoever is supervising it, they can put a letter in your file indicating what you have done. You can request that or your department can request that um, so that you can get both independent evidence that what your contribution has been plus evidence that you write of what your contribution has been. Um, one of the things I always suggest that when there are, to just sort of go a little sideways from what you suggested, when you're involved in multi-authored papers, there is nothing wrong with you writing a little um, line or two after each reference for what your contribution has been to that research. Or again, you can ask the primary author, especially if that author is someone you work with a lot, to submit a letter of support for you indicating what your contribution has been. You can do all of these things. And if that's what the review committee will look for when they say, oh, you have two or three publications, but you are fourth author out of 10, but there's a little note that says you provided the crucial analysis or you provided the crucial set of whatever to make this thing a publishable entity, then you'll get that kind of credit. Um, it's better to provide more, it's always better to provide more information about something than it is not to, because the reviewers are not going to know. And so you always have to go with the idea that the reviewers really don't know what you've done and what your contributions have been. So you can tell them that. They will read it and they will understand it. I just want to mention there's such a thing as a clin cap. Is that correct? Okay. Let's so, just mention that because. All right. So, cap, there is a main cap which consists of 14 faculty who are chosen across the whole university, of which I think there are six from the medical school now. Okay. There are six because the medical school accounts for easily almost half of the cap cases. In addition, six, seven years ago, we set up something called clin cap. <coughs> ClinCap handles all of the health science clinical cases that come to CAP. And it's made up now of four people, four faculty from the medical school who have been on CAP at one point or another so they understand CAP's procedures. Cases, uh, clinic, the health science clinical cases will never go to the full CAP unless clinical CAP sends them there and says we can't evaluate this case or we're evenly divided or something like that. Adjunct series faculty go to another subcommittee of CAP, which is just members of CAP 
who form a subcommittee looking at the adjuncts. The research series also goes to a subcommittee of CAF. They don't typically go to the full CAF. And the other thing you have to remember is that CAF is an advisory committee to the Vice Chancellor for Academic Personnel. And all of the decisions are made by the Vice Chancellor for Academic Personnel with the advice of CAF. So that in some cases, and sometimes this does happen, CAF goes one way, the Vice Chancellor goes the other. And it can happen in different forms. CAP can be positive and the Vice Chancellor can go negative. CAP can be negative and the Vice Chancellor will go positive. It's not the majority of cases, but it's some small subgroup of cases. So who had the final say? The Vice Chancellor for Academic Personnel is, has the final say. The Vice Chancellor for Academic Personnel is delegated by the Chancellor to have the final say. But in essence, the Chancellor is the person who really has the final say. Okay, but the chancellor never sees these cases. There's just too many of them for the chancellor to deal with. The other thing I wanted to mention is when your dossier is put together and it ends up going to CAP or ClinCAP, um, you sign off that you have read all the documents uh, with some of the material deleted and all that. And you have the opportunity to rebut a comment that might have been made that you felt was unfair or was um, not accurately portraying what you think is the truth. So that's part of the process as well, that it's not just that things are going on behind your back. You do have an opportunity to rebut um, material that's um, going to go forward. To, to take this one step further, not only do you have a chance to rebut the material as it moves forward, but you should have the feedback for what happened. This is especially important in your fourth year appraisal. And um, it's extremely important that you get the feedback from CAP and the dean. All fourth year appraisals are what we call dean's finals. That is, the dean makes the final decision, not the vice chancellor, but it goes to CAP. So there are two documents that come back after your fourth year appraisal. The first is a CAP report which consists of about a paragraph, a paragraph and a half, describing what happened. And the other is a little letter from the dean describing what happened. And so you, it is your right to see this. It is also your right to see any evaluative material that comes through related to your cases. So let you can see outside letters redacted, where the, the person's name and affiliation have been removed. And it's your, you know, it's always your right to look at this material. And the other thing is, if your case starts moving forward, most of the cases for promotion or for fourth year appraisals take time to go through the system. It could take anything from six months to a year to even sometimes longer. If things change while the case is moving forward, if you publish another paper, if you did something, you got a grant, if you're in the regular series or something like that, you make sure that that material, that information goes forward. You get it to your department, and it will follow your file as your file moves forward. And it will catch up to your file in almost all cases, unless your file's already been finished. Um, so these are your rights, and you should know them. You should be able to, to, to have access to them and to be able to follow the, the, you know, the files through. At any point, you, could, you should be able to know where your file is just by asking your department. They can find that out in, in, you know, fairly easily. The, the department is the conduit, so materials would go to your department and they would be transferred mm -hmm. to our academic and, affairs office and then to the appropriate place on campus. And the other thing is, within two years, we're going to be totally electronic, theoretically. That's, that's, that's the theory, right? Not not you for your mouth. Mouth. <laughs> no, no, we're, we're going to get there. I know all this stuff because I also work with the Vice Chancellor for Academic Personnel. Um, and I have been doing this for seven years now. And before that, I was um, not only on CAP, I was the vice chair of CAP for a year. So I, I kind of know all the issues about academic personnel coming down from up there at Murphy Hall. But we are going to go electronic one way or another. Are there any questions about the fourth year, or the fourth year reviews? Everyone, if, if this is a good chance to ask about that, if, uh, if there are any. Or the other questions that you have, what else? Well, I just wanted to emphasize one thing I heard from the two of you, because certainly my experiences, as you said, in general, 
we want everybody here to succeed and there's an expectation that most people are succeeding. So again, you shouldn't feel um, that somehow by adding information or something that would make you look bad or stick out or in some way. I mean, the committee's really looking for a full description of everything that you're contributing to the university. And the bottom line is they want to promote people who are contributing and they really value you know, all kinds of tangible contributions. So again, if your particular contribution takes more explaining, that's okay, don't feel bad about that. Just make sure that that explanation is there. When, oh, sorry. Go Who ahead. can you change the series if you want to change? If you do all the things like Dr. Levin suggested, like you do the research, you have a grant, you do public service, you innovate, and you go to a study section, you are invited for the a national committee to be chair of some organization like Dr. Gortner uh, mentioned. So, so, so the question is, and you are in a series, not in tenure, not in residence, if you are in urgent series, and you are doing all the things which already everybody is supposed to do, and you publish, you have the grounds, but you still are, how can you change your series? Okay. So there are two kinds of changes in series that occur, primarily in the medical school, because the medical school has these multiple series. The rest of campus, well, sort of has, but does So if you want to change your series from uh, an adjunct to, say, in residence or something like that, it starts in your department. Your department has to want to change your series. So you need to make the case to your department that you would like a change of series, and they have to support that. And then they, there's, there's always another aspect to this, and that's the money part of it, your salary, but we won't talk about that here because that gets to be crazy in the medical school because there are so many different sources of salary here. But your department has to support your change in series. Once they agree to support it, then they prepare a file and it starts through the system and goes, depending upon what level you're at, if you're an assistant professor, it's typically a dean's decision. If you're in the associate professor or full professor rank, it becomes a decision for CAP to make, to change your series, ultimately. But it has to start in your department. You have to receive support from your department. Now, the other kind of change in series is the other way. And so often, not often, sometimes, faculty in the residence or regular series receive feedback from their fourth year appraisal that they're not doing well. They're not publishing, they're not getting support, they're not getting grants. At that point, when they receive that feedback, it's often very useful to go back to your mentor, go back to your department, and possibly look to a change in series to the health science clinical series. This does happen. As long as you do it before your sixth year is over, you're okay. If you wait till after your sixth year, you can't do it. There's a regulation that you can't do it. So those are the two ways you can change your series as an assistant professor. When you get above assistant professor, it's a little different. I was going to add something really unrelated, but part of your dossier involves um, letters, outside letters at certain stages. And some of those letters are from people that the chairman of your department or the head of the academic personnel elicits, but some of them are from a list that you give. And that list is pretty important. You want to choose people um, that are not your best friends and would write a great letter. And you also want to choose people that know your work. And, so, and people who are not co-authors on your paper. So it's a fine line, but you have to try to get that list to represent people who can evaluate your work knowledgeably, but not um, you know, so subjectively that Cap looks at it and says, well, my god, they've been co-authors and friends and co-grant recipients for years. Of course, they're going to support each other. So you have to choose your letter writers. And also, sometimes you might know a colleague who's really so strict and uneffusive that they might write a very bland letter. So you have to try to um, choose your letter writers properly, because that's part of your evaluation. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I asked the panel maybe Dr. Levine or Dr. Efra specifically, is there, as a person thinks about uh, his or her output in a series where research is valued primarily, 
Uh, is there a number, is there a target for how much, what, what number of papers one should have? I you know only if they're all in nature or you know, in the journal of medicine or whatever, it can be fewer. But is there any kind of a guideline on that that you can, you can offer? That's the mythology that's out there. Um, you, I'm sure you've all gotten some number back from somebody or another that told you how many papers you need. Um, it's not so much number. Although most people on CAP I know I, when I was on CAP, we did it. You count first. You always count first. You know, it's just the way life is. But what's really important is that you have generated a set of findings that define you as a researcher, and as a scientist, or as a life scientist, or as a medical scientist in some way, shape, or form. Sometimes that takes a bunch of papers. Sometimes it only takes a few papers. And it needs to be an area that's recognized by individuals outside of UCLA. Okay? Um, I've seen cases in the, I mean, I've done this for so many years. I've seen cases where people have made from, have gone from assistant to associate professor with two or three publications. But typically they've been in science, nature, you know, neuron, things like that. I, and I'm a neuroscientist, so I kind of, that's what I go by. Um, I've seen people who have 25 publications spread out over 10 different zones have a real problem getting promoted because they don't have a good focus area. And I, I think that's how you have to look at it. You can't look at it as, I need seven papers, I need six papers, or anything like that. You have to look at it what defines your research area and how it's recognized outside. If you have only a few papers, but you've gotten three or four competitive grants from like NIH, you're going to be looked at very positively, or more positively than someone who has 30 papers, never got any of their own support. So it's a balancing act between all these things. But I, I could never say that there's a number of papers. If, if you think about it that way, it, it's not going to work. But on the other hand, you got to realize you got to have more than one. And somewhere out there, you have to have some number. And th there is no real good criteria for the number. It's, it's what it says. And it's also where it's published. I mean, you know, the, the impact of the journals that you publish in is really important, whatever your, your subfield is. And your papers are going to be looked at by the journals that you publish in as well. So that's kind of the best advice I can give on it. Yeah. And I think um, one thing you can do in your personal statement, if you think perhaps um, your publication number might be on the low side, you can say, well, I could have broken this up into two papers, but I felt it would be a more complete mechanistic story and get it into a better journal, um, decided to do one paper. Talking about quality of journals, I've seen it going both ways. Somebody recently was reviewed and they said, well, of course his papers are in Nature. Nature loves that kind of research. You, know? <laughs> you can't win. <laughs> anyway. Uh, it's true, you can't win. <laughs> it's very true. Well, I mean, the one comment I'd say, you know, having looked at it as a clinician, so sort of seeing how this goes, um, in general, they, you know, I do think the committees want to see sort of a consistent output and, again, a trajectory. So remember that you are being looked at, um, at least internally, every couple of years for your internal step promotions. Um, and if you go two years without any publication, you know, there will be a question about kind of what's going on there. So again, if, if you went that period of time because of some amazing thing that's going to be published in Nature, it is important, I think, to really document that, including if, you know, when you're going for those step promotions um, to say, this is what I'm working on, it's in preparation or whatever, so that, so that people know that. No, no, no. Case well, it depends is, on your series, right? It, it depends on yeah. your series. Really. Case reports are counted as creative activity in a health science clinical series. Yeah. But you won't get promoted in the in resident series with case reports. Yeah. But matter, you definitely no can in the in the clinical series. And it's nothing wrong with the case report, but mm -hmm. I was just trying to maybe bring it up a notch 
don't shoot for the lowest common denominator just to satisfy these requirements. You, you're energetic, you could aim higher and find something you like and it'll happen. For some people, it's very obvious. It's not not a problem. But but for individuals who have particular skills and use those skills to enhance the research that that others do when they get to be part of these larger teams, it's a it's a difficult set of things to do. Um, this kind of starts with you again, where you have to indicate for each of the publications or whatever creative activity, what you've done. And to get the department to possibly write a letter indicating that, too, that would go in your file. But to, to say which is more, you know, to, to, to do more of one or the other is, is kind of difficult. It really depends what your areas are. Um, a good example is a statistician. A lot of statisticians, what they do is they provide the statistical support for large clinical studies, which couldn't be done without having statisticians on those studies. They are critical. And you have to make that case that they are critical for those studies. And some statisticians actually have their own research programs where they're doing particular things in statistics that are separate. So they can balance one with the other. Other statisticians really spend almost all of their time working on other large research programs. And the university recognizes that. There is now on the um, academic personnel website, there's a page on, there's a new academic personnel website that just went live about a month ago. There is a um, statement on there about what they call independence, which addresses this issue of, of people who are involved in multi-disciplinary um, research and are always in multi-author papers and are not necessarily the prime or first or last author. And we do our best to evaluate under those circumstances. CAP is, is very cognizant of this now, right? Because this is actually this came through from from the chairs, the chair and vice chair of CAP. So it it's something that you need to do, and you need to realize there are both sides of this. And how much of one or the other you have is really a function of what your own program is like and what, what you do within it. Again, there's no formula that you can have 60% of one and 40% of the other. But everyone should be receiving ongoing mentorship, and this is the kind of thing that you should be addressing with a mentor in real time to be assured that it doesn't... So get down to a fourth year review and there's a concern or beyond that, but to the extent possible that you're comfortable and your mentor is comfortable with the way some of these issues are being worked out in, in the course of your work. So we now have, um, coming out of the uh, uh, vice provost's office, um, Chris Littleton's office, something called the Council of Advisors. The Council of Advisors are a group of individuals many of whom have been on CAP, who mentor um, junior faculty. And it runs across the whole campus, but there's a whole bunch of us that are from the medical school. And if you go up to the, the website and look for the Council of Advisors, you can join that as, as someone to be mentored. And then you will be paired with, with individuals who have experience as well as your, it's not in addition, it's not, it, it's in addition to your departmental mentor. It's not to, meant to replace your departmental mentor. It's just meant to add an additional level of mentoring and help for junior faculty. So for those of you who want to do that, just go out to the website of Council of Advisors. One of the first things I was asked to do when I entered the dean's office was to recruit faculty for the Council of Advisors. And I, with trepidation, it's hard to get people to join things. And there was an outpouring of, of interest. We now have 
we doubled the number from the medical school this last year, or this last year and a half. So th that's really good because we need many more advisors because we have so many faculty. And I I'd like to move it to the health science faculty as well. There aren't that many health science faculty involved. It's mostly the regular and in residence faculty that are involved. Well, I really want to thank the panel. It's been really terrific. Is there would anyone like to make a summary or a final content? I think comment. I think we've covered a lot of a lot of great areas. And uh, if you have questions or problems about any of this, you should email me or call me at any time because that's one of the main things that I do is support the faculty and in particular in academic matters. Dress comfortably. <laughs> Wear sensible shoes <laughs> and sunscreen. And with that, thanks very much to, to the panel and thanks to all of you for being here.